So welcome back, Sarah. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Well, welcome, Thank Sarah. Thank you. I uh, think it's you, Megan. Yes, we're going to jump right in, um, just pivoting off of the last topic, because I think it would be awkward not to just open with this. So I've been pretty consistent about my distrust of unnamed sources. I said I thought the timing of the Atlantic article was suspect, alleging that the president mocked U.S. soldiers killed in battle and that he opted to skip a visit to a veteran cemetery out of concern that the rain would mess up his hair. My first instinct was to question the reporting, and then you actually went on record saying that he has, quote, the greatest amount of respect for the men and women of our armed forces. And and the problem, as I said before, is that the president has a consistent history and pattern of saying incendiary things about people like my father, about people like the Khan family, about people like uh, Colonel Vindman. And if this charge had been leveled anonymously against any other politician, I think people would second guess it. But because it's about someone who has this kind of record of insulting veterans, people tend to believe it, which is why I think it has legs. So I just, I just want your perspective on it. And I want to know if you understand my and other people's perspective on it. And look, it may not matter. He got a big chunk of the veterans vote in the last election. He could very well do it again. But I think character and principle in this still matter. Absolutely. And after spending nearly every single day for two and a half years next to the president, I can tell you I witnessed firsthand the president's respect and admiration for the men and women of our armed forces. I literally traveled all over the world with him. I sat in the room in the Oval Office when the president called to offer condolences to, son, to parents whose son had been killed in the line of duty. Uh, that takes a toll on a person. The president did that, and I watched that, and I saw saw his heart in those moments. I also saw him overseas make us take a separate stop when we were going to stop at two o'clock in the morning and wanted to visit the troops. They said, sir, you don't have to get off the plane. Stay here. Said, we're not landing at an air base and not getting off and saying thank you to the men and women who have served. I watched him time and time again. And on the instance that is written about in the Atlantic, I was one of the few people that were in the room. I'm not an anonymous source. I'm going on the record and I'm telling you it didn't happen. That's not who this president is and that's not how he feels about the men and women who serve in our military. Okay. Sarah, there are also growing calls for an end to what many see as systemic racism in law enforcement. But President Trump has denied it exists and blames these incidents on bad apples or good cops who choke at decisive moments. Do you agree? I certainly think that there have been some horrific moments um, and certainly some very bad things that should cause outrage in our country. But I don't think that that means that we should demonize every single member of law enforcement. Let's not forget that the men and women of our law enforcement are the first people to respond when we need help. They were the first ones to run into the buildings on 9-11. They are the first ones to respond when there's a car accident, when there is a mother who's been being raped in her home. They are the ones that come in and protect our communities. That doesn't mean they're all perfect. That doesn't mean that there aren't moments where horrible things have happened that should never happen. People should be angry about that, but we shouldn't attack the entire law enforcement community and make them out to be the bad guy when most of the people that serve in our law enforcement are very much the good guys that are protecting us from a very dangerous world. When President Trump uh, visited Kenosha, he praised law enforcement, but never mentioned, nor did he speak with Jacob Blake, the black man who was shot seven times by police in the back. And that was the impetus for the protests. Now, the president has, however, refused to disavow the actions of 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, who allegedly crossed state lines with an AR-15 style rifle and killed two protesters. So my question to you is, how can a law and order president justify what many would call vigilante justice in the name of protecting property? Look, the president's been very clear. We cannot continue to have rioting and looting taking place in our cities. If we want to see real change and real reform, let's stop burning down the businesses and the communities that these problems are happening in. Let's sit down at the table and talk about real solutions. 
President, President Trump has actually been leading on trying to calm things down and stop this. Vice President Biden has been hiding in his basement doing nothing. Why not until reach the out to Jacob changed. Blake? And now all of a sudden, hold on. Why not now reach out to Jacob the Blake? The polls are turning. Why not reach out we to see Jacob Pres Blake? I, I think he certainly could. I don't have a problem with him doing that, and I think it would be a nice thing for Why him to do. Why didn't he? However, I don't. I, I, you'll have to ask the president, but what I can tell you that he has done mm -hmm. is lead on having safe communities. No child in America, whether they are black, white, brown, or any other color, should be afraid to walk down the streets in this country. And that is something the president has been strong on and Vice President Biden has been incredibly weak on. And not only have they been weak on it, they've hidden. They haven't commented on it until the polls started to change. That's not conviction. That is convenience. And that is who Joe Biden is. I do not think there could be a clear Joe contrast Biden did speak to in Jacob the upcoming Blake, election though. than what has taken place over the last couple of weeks. He did speak to Jacob Blake, though. But he's done Sarah. nothing to Sarah. empower the black community. He has done nothing to help change and bring safety to our communities. If anything, <laughs> Joe Biden has, has set back and, and, and literally done nothing to help. I, I don't understand how making that phone call is changing the dynamic of having safer communities. I think it's a nice thing that he did. I think that it would be great if the president in did Trump's it as well. America, but at the end of the day, this people is happening want in Trump's America. If, this is not Joe Biden's America. This is Trump's America. This is happening under your president's watch. In and Democrat-run cities, every place so, that you see these major incidents and these riots, it's in Democrat-led cities. And it's not like they just became Democrat-led cities. They've been Democrat-run for decades. The worst places we have these problems are where Democrats have been allowed to lead. We're finally starting to clean this mess up, starting to make things <laughs> oh, wow. better. This is a president who has empowered the African-American community. He's done more than his oh, predecessors. Oh Question, we have the please. lowest unemployment okay. for black Americans, <laughs> historic funding for oh, HBCUs, oh opportunity zones, ahead. criminal Go justice ahead, reform. Sarah, it's only an hour show. Sarah, it's only an hour show. Go um, ahead, Joy. <laughs> you know, I, I just want to ask my planned question. I want to clear something up with you, because I think I heard you say that you, uh, you don't believe the Jeffrey Goldberg article because you were there. Is that correct? Correct. The incident that they were specifically okay. talking about, okay. uh, I was there so, for that discussion. Okay. Okay, so my question is, when, when General Kelly was at Arlington Cemetery standing next to Trump, looking at his son's graveside, and uh, Trump allegedly said, what did they get out of it? Were you there for that? I was not standing next to the president for that, no. Okay, so you But so, I have stood so next to the president you were there, but you weren't and there General all the time. Kelly. <laughs> okay. I, right. I, was, my, I traveled with the question. president for two and a half years. I spent more time with I, I him than just answer. about anybody. And I'm telling you I that I understand answer. who Sarah. he is at his heart and how he's treated veterans okay. and how he has treated Jump men and women right of the United States military. Okay. Sorry, Listen, Joy. I, I I'm just going to die also. So I'm just going to jump in really quick opinion, on this. Okay? We all share a different opinion. Right. I think the problem is, Sarah, and again, I, you and I know each other. The problem is you were also serving in the White House when President Trump decided to not uh, have the flags raised when my father passed, which, mm -hmm. which had very great outrage. You, you were there during a lot of instances. You also probably know that I have spoken with President Trump on the phone in the past about issues like this. I think he's aware that there has been serious damage done by the criticism not only of my family, because it's not just about my family, but like I said, the cons and Colonel Vindman and people like that as well. And the problem with this story is it seems like something he would do. And I, I don't doubt that you've had experiences and I've seen videos of President Trump with troops and his family. But this has not been my experience. I know from me and my brothers who serve, it, we do not feel respected. We are a military family that does not feel respected or appreciated by this president. And I think part of the problem is it's great unless you're a person who disagrees with the president. And then in that case, your service becomes people who weren't captured. So I understand you have to do a job because you are his surrogate and you have to do a job because you're his supporter. But at least concede that it has to it has to be very uncomfortable to have this kind of conversation with me right now. Uh, certainly, I, I don't doubt that at all, and I do understand, and I was with the president 
um, in those moments. I was with the president when he made the decision uh, to send the aircraft for your father. Look, there's no denying the fact that not only did Donald Trump dislike your father, your father disliked the president and they had some very heated exchanges. Yes. Um, and on the other hand, I personally campaigned for your dad in 2008, despite our disagreements and despite our differences, I think he would have made an infinitely better president than Barack Obama. I was campaigning for your dad when some of the colleagues that you sit you next to were calling him a liar. So I'm sorry. You've never disrespected my family, Sarah. And, and that's the point I'm making. However, and I, it's okay. not because I have a job to do. It's not because I'm a surrogate for the president. It's because I witnessed it with my own eyes. I saw the president day in and day out treat the men and women of our military with respect. I watched him lean over and touch a veteran's face who had lost his arms because he wanted him to feel human contact. I'm not saying that there okay. weren't some moments that were heated, that were not of the highest level of respect, but when it comes to who this president is at his heart and how he feels about the men and women of our armed right. services, I can say from my own experience, yeah. he has a great level of respect.